Well, we kind of already know where we're at tonight. Um, we're going to be finishing up the rest of John 14. Uh, we're going to be specifically looking at John 14, 15 through 31. Um, kind of the main central theme of the whole chapter of John 14 is the idea of salvation and the Trinity. And those are the two main topics of the, that entire chapter. Um, this particular portion of the chapter is really focused a lot more on the Holy Spirit more than uh, <clears throat> anything else. Um, so uh, to kind of begin with, I have a kind of a comparison, uh, and that is between apples and oranges. Um, apples and oranges are both fruit. Uh, they're both edible, and they both have skin. Uh, they both have seeds, and they both are kind of round. Um, but they're different from each other. They, they feel different. They, they look a little different. But most importantly, they have radically different insides than each other. Um, another thing that I thought of similar to each other are those really gross jelly beans, those bean boozled, where you get one that's flavored like a, a lime, but the other one's flavored like a booger. But they both look identical, so you don't know until you eat them what they're actually going to taste like and which one you got. So it's kind of that way with us as believers and, and so it's people that are lost, right? There is a difference between someone who's, who is, who is saved and someone who's lost. And it does come down to the insides and what's going on inside their heart and whether or not they've been transformed or not um, and born again. Mm -hmm. So that is kind of the question that came up when I was looking at this sermon is, what is the difference between someone who's saved and someone who's lost? So if we return to John 14, 15 to 31, we can see that as we read through that passage, uh, we can kind of answer that question. Um, <clears throat> starting in verse 15, uh, it says, If you love me, you will keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. He is the spirit of truth. The world is unable to receive him because it does not see him or know him. But you do know him because he remains with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I am coming to you in a little while. The world will no longer see me, but you will see me because I live. You will live too. On that day, you will know that I am, the, I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. The one who has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me, and the one who loves me will be loved by my Father. I will also I also will love him and will reveal myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it you're going to reveal yourself to us and not the world? Jesus answered, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. My father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. The one who doesn't love me will not keep my words. The word that you hear is not mine, but is from the Father who sent me. I have spoken these things to you while I remain with you, but the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have told you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give, it to, give to you as the world gives. Don't let your heart be troubled or fearful. You have heard me tell you I am going away and I am coming to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice that I am going to the Father, because the Father is greater than I. I have told you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you may believe. I will not talk with you much longer, because the ruler of the world is coming. He has no power over me. On the contrary, so that the world may know that I love the Father, I do as the Father commanded me. Get up, let's leave this place. So, <clears throat> Jesus, throughout these whole passages, is predicting his death on the cross, which is about to happen, and we'll see that in a couple of weeks. Um, but he's also predicting the arrival of a counselor, some, something that is going to come to comfort and, and, and teach the believers that have followed his commands and loved him and, that, and so on and so forth. And the world itself cannot receive this follower, this counselor. Um, <clears throat> so, what makes someone who is saved different from someone who is lost? Um, if we look back at verse 15, we can see that if you love me, you will keep my commands. Um, 
So someone who loves and truly loves the Lord will try to do their best to follow after what the Lord wants in their life. And ultimately, they will turn to the Lord because ultimately that's the greatest thing that the Lord wants to, someone to do is to have a relationship with his son, Jesus. Um, when we look at verse 16, it says, Someone who is saved, or well, it says, uh, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. So someone who is saved can receive the Holy Spirit, which will be with them forever. Someone who is lost cannot receive the Holy Spirit and doesn't understand it. Uh, Jesus was going to leave his followers. Uh, he wasn't going to leave his followers as orphans, but he was going to send the Holy Spirit to help them. With all this, <clears throat> there lies a few other questions, which are somewhat simple to answer, but uh, in order to understand the importance of what Jesus is talking about, there's a few things you also have to understand. Uh, those other questions are, how can the Holy Spirit dwell within people? What is salvation? And what is the Holy Spirit? So how can the Holy Spirit dwell, or come to dwell within people? Uh, according to these verses in John, the only way that the Holy Spirit can come into a person is for them to first be saved. And that requires for them to have a love for Jesus, um, as these verses talked about. Uh, this in and of itself is the, one of the, is the primary difference between someone who has been saved versus someone who doesn't isn't saved because they don't yet have that love for Christ. They might obtain it and they may not. They might reject God completely and, and you know continue to live in darkness. Um, John fourteen seventeen says, "He is the Spirit of Truth." <clears throat> uh, if, we, if we look at that verse, it says that He is the Spirit of Truth. The world is unable to receive Him because it doesn't see or know Him, but you know Him because He remains with you and will will be in you. So this verse is talking about how the world doesn't necessarily understand the concept of the Holy Spirit because they can't feel the presence of the Lord. And while at this time they could still physically see Jesus, there was coming a time where the only people that were going to be able to experience the presence of the Lord in that way would be those who were saved and who had been transformed and had this Holy Spirit come and dwell within them. Um, <clears throat> so it's... Um, Kind of one of those things I kind of think about with this kind of stuff when it comes to uh, when you love something, you spend a lot of time with it. Uh, I used to have a youth pastor who used to say that lo uh, love is a four-letter word that's spelled T-I-M-E and instead of actually spelling it love because when you look, care about something, you spend a lot of time thinking about it and doing things with it and that kind of stuff. Um, So if we look back at verse 14, it says that I will not leave you as orphans, I'm coming to you. So Jesus isn't going to abandon his followers. He is going to send, the, the, count, the counselor is going to come, um, even though he's about to go to the cross. He's not going to leave them high and dry all, all by themselves. Um, <clears throat> so that leads us to the question of how... Or, what exactly is it that, ha that people have to do in order to receive the Holy Spirit? And that key in that is having an understanding of what salvation is. Uh, so JJ covered uh, a lot about salvation this morning, uh, but we'll, still, we'll just go back through and cover it briefly. Um, salvation is defined as preser preservation or deliverance from harm, ruin, or loss. This means that salvation is an act of being saved from something that would cause us harm, right? Um, so, for example, let's say a box is about to fall on Marcus's head, and Johnny either stops the box or pushes Marcus out of the way so the box doesn't hit him. Well, in that way, Marcus has received salvation from Johnny from the box. It's the same way with us with Jesus, because when Jesus um, <clears throat> went to the cross, he, he paid the price that we needed him to pay and provided us a pathway of salvation and deliverance from our sins. Um, Sort of like Jay-Z was talking about this morning, Romans 10, 9 through 10 says, if, we can, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. One believes with the heart, resulting in righteousness, and one confesses with the mouth, resulting in salvation. So we, <clears throat> we needed a Savior because of our nature, our sin nature that we had, that this issue that, of the sin that was keeping us as separate from, from being able to have a relationship with God. Um, Romans 6, 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
This is this gift is the salvation from our sins. Jesus paid for the world on the cross. We simply have to be willing to believe and call upon the name of the Lord to receive this gift. Um, as JJ talked about this morning, when we look back earlier in the chapter, in chapter 14, verses 6 through 7, it says that Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except for me. If you know me, you will know my Father. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And part of what Jesus is talking about there is the fact that Jesus is God in flesh. You literally have God incarnate in the form of a man preaching to these people and teaching to the disciples. Um, and that's important later on when we go and we talk about what the Holy Spirit is and, and really break down <clears throat> the fact that the Holy Spirit is the third part of that trinity. Right? It's God the Holy Spirit. Um, and Jesus was there in the very beginning. If we look at um, 1 John, verses 1 through 5, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created through Him, and apart from Him, no, not one thing was created that had been created. In Him was life, and that life was the light of men. That light shines in the darkness, and yet the darkness did not overcome it. Again, in uh, verse, so Jesus was there at the very beginning. We understand that Jesus was was there all the way back in Genesis. Um, he's he's always been around, uh, and he, he is he is again he's he's God. He's another aspect of God. Um, another verse that sort of talks about this is for verses uh, verse eleven in chapter fourteen. Of John, it says, "Believe me, that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Otherwise, believe because of the works themselves." Jesus is just refer reaffirming the idea of the Trinity: how Jesus is God, and you know, vice versa. They're, they're both. He is just God. He's God in the form of a man. Um, it's because of, it's because of this that when Jesus dies on the cross, he's able to do the sacrifice we needed because it's the only way that he's able to live the perfect life that we needed him to be, in order for him to be that sacrifice that we needed him to be. Um, so if we look at back again at John um, 14, uh, verses 27 through 31, when Jesus is predicting his death, he's no longer going to be able to be with them, but it doesn't necessarily mean he's going to abandon them or that he's going to leave them high and dry without anybody. He, he, in fact, he wishes them peace. He tells them, peace I leave with you, my peace I will give to you. I do not give it to you so the, as the world gives. Don't let your heart be troubled or fearful. You have heard me tell you, tell you I am going away and I am coming to you. If you love me, you would rejoice that I am going to the Father because the Father is greater than I. I have told you now before it happens so that when it does happen, you may believe. I will not talk with you much longer because the ruler of the world is coming. He has no power over me. On the contrary, so that the world may know that I love you. I love the Father, I do as the Father commanded me. Get up and let us leave this place. And so when we look at those verses, Jesus is talking about a peace that's going to come to his followers, even though he's going to go to the cross, and he's about to leave them in, in the physical world, there is something coming, a, a, this Holy Spirit, this peace, that they're, they're going to be able to receive um, coming around on, on the time of Pentecost when that eventually comes. Um, <clears throat> so this peace... Uh, he is the Holy Spirit, and it's coming to dwell within the believers or followers of Christ. Uh, someone who doesn't follow or truly love Christ isn't going to be able to receive that Holy Spirit because they, they just don't understand it. Um, if we look again at John 14, 22 through 24, it says, This peace is the Holy Spirit. Or, well, Jesus, Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, it is, <clears throat> is it your going to reveal, your, reveal yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. With him, The one who does not love me will not keep my word. The world, or the word that you hear is not mine, but is from the Father who sent me. So the world is not going to be able to receive the Holy Spirit because they don't understand, and they, they can't really comprehend that. Um, and they, they don't really truly love uh, Jesus in the way because they're not willing to surrender their lives over to him mm -hmm. um, so what then if we understand what salvation is and we understand that that is the primary difference the, 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 through salvation and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit 
uh, is really the difference between someone who's saved versus someone who's not saved, then what exactly is the Holy Spirit? Well, the Holy Spirit is the third part of the Trinity, which are <clears throat> all different aspects of God, the same way that you might have uh, you know, different hats or roles um, that you might play in, in the lives of other people. So, for instance, uh, Scotty is a pastor, a husband, a father, and a grandfather, and those are just different aspects of Scotty, and it's kind of the same way with the Trinity. When you look at God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, those are different aspects of God, but they're all God. Um, what's amazing with that is when we really think about that, the Holy Spirit being another aspect of God means that when the Holy Spirit comes and dwells within us, we have God literally coming and making a permanent home within us. Um, it is also important to note that the Holy Spirit was around during the Old Testament, it was, it was doing stuff. It just wasn't able to dwell within people yet. The, the difference, I would say, would be the Holy Spirit dwelt with them. It wasn't able to dwell within them. Um, and there's examples of that, right, with the prophets, how the word of the Lord would come to the prophets and then it would leave. Or how the word of the Lord would, uh, the, the Lord was on uh, Saul, but after Saul sinned and disobeyed God, the spirit of the Lord left him. It didn't stay with him. And it's the same thing with David and Bathsheba. When David sins with, uh, with Bathsheba, the Spirit of the Lord leaves David for a time, and it's why he writes Psalm 51. Um, the difference is that since Jesus went to the cross on Calvary for to be the, the, the sacrifice that we needed him to be for our sins, we can have the Holy Spirit come and dwell within us if we have confessed with our mouth and believed in him. And in doing so, we're transformed by the Holy Spirit. We're literally born again. We're changed by it. Um, As I said, that statement is profound because when the Holy Spirit comes and dwells within us, God makes within us a permanent residence, and he does not leave us as he did with those who were under the Old Covenant. Um, and that's pretty cool when you think it's the same God who spoke you know, the world into existence and breathed life into Adam. Um, so <clears throat> this indwelling also means that we can have an extremely re intimate relationship with God. If we look back at John uh, chapter 14, verses 20, it says, On that day you will know that I am the Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. So when we look at that, we, we understand that the Holy Spirit comes and dwells within us. It's literally God dwelling within the, his followers. Um, now the importance of that is it doesn't mean that people, when they get saved, become God. It's just that God comes and dwells within them. It, it, that is an important distinction. Um, and there are benefits of that because it allows us to have a very intimate relationship with God that we otherwise wouldn't be able to have. Um, <clears throat> so when the Holy Spirit comes and it dwells within us, uh, there are several things that the Holy Spirit can do for a believer, and we'll see, we see that throughout John uh, 14. Uh, the Holy Spirit provides the believer with comfort. Uh, and gives them peace. It teaches, te um, it teaches the disciples and counsels us. It also helps the disciples to remember the life and ministry of Christ. If we look at verse 26, it says, But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have told you. It also helps us to understand the truth and allows us to feel the presence of the Lord, which the world cannot feel or understand while some, somebody is lost. They, that can change if they come to be saved by Christ and the Holy Spirit comes and dwells in them. But before that moment, they don't really understand the Holy Spirit. It's kind of like they're still living under the, the old covenant. Um, the Holy Spirit might be able to influence them in kind of different ways and stuff, but it doesn't necessarily, they, they don't have that intimate relationship that a believer has with him. Um, he is the Spirit of, uh, verse... 14, or John 14, verse 17 says, He is the Spirit of truth. The world is unable to receive him because it does not see him or know him. But you do know him because he remains with you, and I will be in you. So all these passages are referring to both the coming death of Christ, but also to the fact that he is sending, uh, he's trying to comfort his followers with the fact that the Holy Spirit is coming. Um, and so he promises that, and so because you have Jesus, who is God, promising that the Holy Spirit is coming, it's going to happen. Um, and it does happen. We know from the book of Acts. 
Uh, he promises again that the Holy Spirit's going to come during the Great Commission. If we look at Acts 1, 4 through 8, it says, While he was with them, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for the Father's promise, which he said, You have heard me speak about, about for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit in a few days. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, are you restoring the kingdom to Israel at this time? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or periods that the Father has, has set by his own authority, but you will receive a pow power when the Holy Spirit has come to you. And you will be my witnesses in the Jerusalem, in all of Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Um, so both of these, both chapter 14 of John and uh, chapter 1, verses 4 through 8 in Acts, are referring to this time of Pentecost that is yet to come at that time but has come, you know, we're in the time we're living in now. Um, and that time of Pentecost is, is described in Acts 2, verses 1 through 4. And it says, When the day of Pentecost had arrived, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like that of a violent rushing wind came from heaven, and it filled the whole house where they were staying. They saw tongue, tongues like flames of fire that separated and rested on each, of, each one of them. Then they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in different tongues as the Spirit enabled them. So in that verses we see that the Holy Spirit comes and dwells within them. And really from that moment forward, anytime someone is saved, the Holy Spirit does the same thing. It comes and it dwells within them and it comforts them and gives them that guidance that they need. And that's what Jesus is talking about in the second half of John 14. He's talking about the fact that while he's physically going away, he is leaving them with this Holy Spirit to guide and counsel them and to look after them. Um, <clears throat> so one of the things, and part of the reason I brought this particular Bible is, I think that one of the things we do is we kind of don't treat the Holy Spirit very well. Uh, we kind of take it for granted. Um, and this, this particular Bible that I got, there's a note in it that was written by this guy named Gregory the Great, who was, I guess, one of the guys that was like involved with the Council of Nicaea and all that stuff. Uh, and it said, his note on, uh, was specifically on chap John uh, 14, verses 23 to 23, says, uh, Consider, dearly beloved, how great this solemnity is that commemorates the coming of God as a guest in our hearts. If some rich and powerful friend were to enter your home, you would quickly clean up the entire house for fear something there might offend your friend's eyes when he entered. Let anyone who is pre preparing his inner house for God cleanse away the dirt of his evil deeds. He does not indeed enter the hearts of some, but does not make his home there. Or he does indeed enter the hearts of some, but does not make his home there, because through repentance they acquire a respect for God, but during a time of temptation they forget that they have repented, and so return to committing sins, as if they had never been wept, wept over them at all. The Lord comes into the heart and makes his home in the one who truly loves God and observes his commandments. Since the love of his divine nature so penetrates him that he does not turn away from him from it during times of temptation. That person loves truly whose heart does not consent to be overcome by wicked pleasures. And the only reason I read that is because it kind of made me think about how we do take the Holy Spirit for granted when it comes and dwells in us, the fact that God is literally coming and making a home in us. When we go and we sin and we do those bad things, we're taking God into those places, and we really shouldn't be doing that. But yet, at the same time, we would probably treat a house guest better than we would treat the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> um, but for an unbeliever, as we discussed, though, they don't really understand and they can't understand. They can't comprehend. They don't have that. And like I said earlier, it's it's kind of like they're, they're still living under the old covenant because they haven't turned their eyes to Jesus. They haven't repented. They haven't uh, sought out salvation yet. Um, and like I said, it can still maybe it, it, the Holy Spirit can still influence them, but it doesn't. It can't dwell within them. Um, so today we've talked about the Holy Spirit and how the differences between someone who is saved and someone who is lost is the fact that they have asked the Lord to come into their heart, and in doing so, have received the Holy Spirit, which has made them a new being, a new creation. Um, so. Uh, kind of end the message uh, has the Holy Spirit come and dwelt within you or are you still like a lost person who cannot feel or understand if you are there are plenty of people here that would like to talk with you that's all I got
You want us to ask questions, Steve? I don't care. <laughs> <laughs>